embrace his identity as Messiah. That Jesus will be met with a king and savior's welcome by waving palm leaves in the air and praising God for the king as they call out, Hosanna, meaning save us. Let us remember this day by reading John 12, <laughs> verses 12 through 19. And it reads, the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as, he was, as it was written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on the donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. And now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him, so that the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Lori, we are ready for your music this morning.
would y'all did a great, great job. Thank you for starting our, our worship today and kicking off with such excitement. Uh, today is a day to be excited. Uh, today is, as April said, Palm Sunday. We come to welcome in this amazing week that uh, filled with highs and lows of Jesus's life and it ultimately ends with the good news of a risen Savior in Jesus Christ. And so we're so glad that you chose to be a part of us today. I'm, I'm Pastor Brady Johnston and Pastor April Thaler, and we're excited to share this great day together. Um, you might have seen, as you came in, some cards on your seat, or maybe you didn't and you just sat down on one. Uh, that is, is possible. Um, if you just feel something, under, you just, just go ahead and hold on to it. We'll get to that later in the service. But we're so glad you came and looking forward to this worship service in which we share. We're going to sing the song Hosanna next. And if you want to bring your palm branches down and lay them at the altar during the song, we invite you to do so. But let's stand and sing together. Good morning. And as Pastor Brady says, if we start singing this morning, Hosanna, feel free to just come forward and join us as you're walking down. Sing along with the choir, but Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Join us this morning as you pr uh, press us down here with your uh, palm leaves.
have a seat as we ask our little ones to come forward so they can go to godly play. All right. All right, ladies, y'all come on down. Well, y'all did a great job. Thank you so much for getting us kicked off in our worship service today. We sure appreciate you. And if any of y'all weren't up there singing, know that we'd love to have you join us at 5 o'clock for our kids' choir on Wednesdays. But as you get ready for godly play on this great Sunday, let's pray together, okay? Jesus, we celebrate you. We welcome you here in this place. We welcome you to be with our children as they go to godly play, as they tell the most important story about the greatest week that has ever existed. May their hearts and ears be open. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was reading this morning in my devotional, there was a scripture that popped up that I've been singing for many, many years. No, it's not this one. But I wanted to bring this scripture before you because Joshua 24, 15 says, Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So in all that we do, whatever we choose to do, do it for the love of the Lord and do it in the name of the Lord. Let's continue to worship this morning. stand for the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. you to join me in prayer. Jesus, we come to you recognizing that you are the one who first came to us, that we know what love is because your father sent you among us to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. 
that you came to live for us, to die for us, and you were raised that we might have new life through you. We are grateful and we celebrate this in many ways by entrusting ourselves to you, by entrusting everything we have and everything that we are to you. And part of what we put in the plate this day is just an expression of a greater gift of our life for you because you gave your life for us. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer. Jesus, we call out to you today because we know that this day you were teaching us about what is different between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. We know this is the day that you decided that you wanted to become the Messiah and allow people to praise you and adore you as well they should. There are many times that we do not spend the time to be grateful. We don't spend the time to be thankful. We don't spend the time to know that everything that we are and everything that we do is yours first. And in this time, as you represent the Messiah that we are all seeking, there's a part of us that's a little bit jealous that we didn't get a chance to see you. But in fact, you are here. You are among us. 
And that we know we have much to do as disciples to be able to follow your example. And this is indeed what the world craves most. A place of peace. A place where we can hear the still small voice speaking to us. That we can come to know you in new ways. And we can learn our lives to live one step at a time, again, again, and again. How we can lean into our faith and see your face. So that anything we're struggling with right now pales in comparison to the shine, to the grace that is available to us. We need you, Lord. We need you every hour of every day. That no matter what's going on behind our scenes, we know that your scene is more powerful. We know sometimes we struggle with things, whether it's addiction or alcohol or constant frustration or sorrow from someone we've lost or sorrow about somebody we know we might lose soon. Lord, that I ask you to grant that peace for all who are suffering today. Grant your mercy as we begin to, to look towards you during our times of trouble. Make us an easy path so that we can Look up and beyond what we have going on here in this world, and we can find a way just to focus on you. Teach us to pray. Teach us to hope. Teach us to be strong. Rearrange us in ways that we may not understand, but we know and trust you enough that we will obey. Let us open our hearts so that you may enter in. Open our ears and our eyes so that we can see the best in people the way you see them. They're on this Palm Sunday. We celebrate. Though we have much to talk about, much to pray about, we must pause and celebrate. That indeed you've walked into this world to offer us something that we can never imagine without you. Stay your hand and let us fix our eyes upon you. Because we know you're there. We trust that. I pray that we can obey what you ask of us. I pray that we can trust you with all that we are. And in all things, as being a disciple, we're going to trip, we're going to fall. But as disciples, we are called to stand right back up and do it again and again and again. So Lord, we thank you for those opportunities to continue to do your work even though We've got a lot of work to do. So now let's say the, the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
invite you, if you have your Bible, to turn with me to John chapter 13. We'll be reading verses 1 through 17 today. Uh, we are, we'll be watching in this chapter how Jesus, the master teacher, um, puts on a class of what it means to love like Christ. Uh, this story is so important that the entire gospel of John, it, it shifts on this one story. And my prayer this week has been, as we encounter the Word of God, that there would be a shift in us. And so let's turn to the Word in John chapter 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. 
Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightfully so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set for you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we have here the, the opening of John 13, this kind of pivotal story. We have Jesus with the awareness that his end, uh, his, the end of his public ministry here on the earth is coming to a close. And yet John tells us in verse 1, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. What a statement. Like at a time of life when, when things are coming to a close, our thoughts often turn inward into ourselves. And not Jesus. As the end comes near, his thoughts turn to those whom God has entrusted to him and his disciples. Beautiful thing. And he's compelled to do something, an act of, of, of great love for them. We find in the evening meal in verse 2 was in progress, and the devil already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Now, this is one of those things we have a lot of questions on. Uh, people tend to ask what, what's happening, what's the dynamic, and all the Gospels describe this a little bit differently. But what John tells us is that, is that the enemy prompted Judas by, and what the word prompted is, is to place, that he placed in Judas's heart the, the temptation to betray Jesus. And this is the way that temptation works. Temptation starts in the mind, it goes to the heart, and if we're not careful, we step into the realm of sin when it moves from head to heart to actions. And so Judas, though it was placed in his heart, the sin was that he acts on the temptation to betray Jesus. And we see that here in, in verse 2. In verse 3, we have this, this, this powerful statement it can be easy to miss in a very powerful story. It says, Jesus knew that his father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. This, this statement here is a statement about Jesus' identity. And, and not only is it about Jesus' identity, it's about Jesus understanding his identity, understanding who he is, and more importantly, whose he is. And I find it interesting that before John gets into the story to describe what Jesus does, he first leans on us knowing that Jesus knows who he is. 
And part of what John is saying here to us is he's saying what Jesus does in this supreme act of service and love, it comes out of who he is. It's not just something good that he does. It emerges from his character, from his heart, and from his nature. And that's an important thing for us to hold on to as, as we move through the story. This, this act of love, it comes out of who Jesus is. And look what he does. Verse 4, it says, Jesus got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing and wrapped in a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. So what's, what's happening here in this scene? Uh, it was kind of social custom in their day when you were hosting a party, and that's what this is. This is a party and that, that you would have as a host a servant who would wash the feet of the guests. So social etiquette... Uh, meant that if you were attending a party, you would, you would bathe beforehand because you want people to enjoy you. When you reclined at the table, you, you put your arm out. So like you want your guests to enjoy their food, the person next to you. So, so you, 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 you bathe beforehand, but when you walk to the party on dirt streets, your, your feet would get dirty. So they would have a servant there as a, as a sign of hospitality to wash the feet of the guests, just the feet. And, and this was considered the most debasing act, the most socially demanding act that a servant could perform for anyone, including their master. In fact, it was so socially demanding and destructive to, to your reputation uh, that they did not let Jewish slaves and servants wash feet. Only Gentiles, only non-Jewish Slaves could, could wash feet. It's too demanding for a Jew to do. So if a host didn't have a Gentile slave, then the job was often left undone, which is what we see here. And yet in the meal, as they're eating, they watch Jesus get up. And he takes off his cloak. And he's standing in his, his essentially what we would call his underwear, which is just it's a hard picture for us. And he wraps a towel around his waist and throws it over his shoulder. And they watch in this moment as their Lord and teacher transforms into a servant. Into the lowest of servants. And that's all they can see. No one's paying attention to the food on the table. No one's reaching. No one's sharing jokes or fellowship. They watch their Lord and teacher become the lowest of servants. That's what they see. That's what we see here. At this. We see a servant. And Jesus not only gives them a picture of a servant, he assumes the posture of a servant, kneeling down to wash their feet. And Jesus teaches us something so important here, and it's what I would call maybe the irony of Christ-like love. And it's that we rise to the heights of Christ-like love when we stoop down to serve others. Like There's an irony in that, isn't it? We rise to the heights of this amazing love that we witness here in this story only when we humble ourselves to become a servant to another. It's incredible. But I think for many of us, like we love this story um, because it, it is both beautiful, but if we're honest with ourselves, it, it's beautiful, but it's also terrifying, isn't it? It's beautiful when we think of Jesus loving us and others in this way. But when we think about the way he turns it back on us at the end, oh my goodness, it feels a little terrifying, doesn't it? Because if we're honest, like most of us, we want love to be easy. We love it when we talk about love as, as you know, being nice to somebody. We can do nice, right? Right? And it's not bad to be nice to somebody, don't get me wrong, but, but it's a far cry from what we see here in this story. I think truth be told, you know, like we, we don't, 
we, we want love to be convenient, not costly. Like we want when we, we love someone, um, for, for us to not have to empty ourselves, we're more concerned about feeling good on the other end of it. Like we don't want to lay down our cloaks and to take up a towel. And I think for many of us, like the, this story, like we, we love it, but there's a, there's a part of us that, that haunts us here. Because what Jesus says is to love someone, to serve someone, means you abandon convenience and you take up the cost. It, it means that you aren't concerned about feeling good on the back end of what you've done or given. Instead, you just choose to empty yourself for another. It's beautiful, but it's terrifying, isn't it? We see in verse 7, Jesus says to the disciples, You do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. It sounds a little ominous, doesn't it? And it is. And Jesus is right. They don't understand. They don't. And, and I'll explain why I'm confident they did not understand what he was doing here. And we'll cover that at the end. So hold Hold on to that one. As they move around the table, when Jesus gets to Peter, um, he kneels down at Peter's feet, and Peter says, No, Lord, you shall never wash me. You shall never wash me. Now, I wonder what, what was going through Peter's mind as, as he hears this, he sees this, and he, and he responds, No, Lord, you, you shall never wash me. I was thinking about how to make that kind of real for us today, to feel kind of what Peter felt. And the only conclusion I could come to today was it would be good to demonstrate what it feels like to have your feet washed. And so um, we'll do that in the sermon. So um, I've not arranged this, by the way. One of you are going to get chosen as the lucky person to have their foot washed in front of the entire church today. Um, fortunately, I came with a basin of water and Look what I have right here. So um, I didn't arrange it, or I'm not going to ask for a volunteer, because I know you'd all come running at once to be the person down here. And I can tell everyone in the first few rows is really nervous right now. <laughs> and you're probably thinking, I really wish I would have sat in the back today. Uh, why didn't we sit in the back? And the people in the back probably feel pretty good, because they think I'm not going to walk all the way back there and choose one of them. Well, that's where I'm going. You guys are safe. So, Boy, I bet y'all wish y'all worshipped online today, huh? That's what. Let's see. Which one of you? Most of y'all won't even look at me. You, you don't even I want to make eye contact for fear, for fear, like I'm going to choose one of you. Well, you know, it's going to, might as well get it over with, right? David. <laughs> I'm just messing with y'all. I'm not going to wash anybody's feet today. I wouldn't. But you felt it, didn't you? Like, you did. When I walked past you, you, you felt what Peter felt. Like that, don't, don't, don't choose me. You know, like your muscles tensed up. Some of you already hatched an escape plan. Like if, <laughs> like, honey, if he chooses us, bail to the left and let's go join the Baptist church. You know, like. You, you felt it, like you felt the same thing. Choir, you were safe, but, but we, felt, we felt it. Like we felt the flood of things that kind of come through you when, when the basin gets to you. And Peter had all those things go through his mind, all the things of, of I, I don't know, you know, like who, who are you? And that's what you thought, but my pastor washed my feet? You know, I, some of us are like, we, we hide our feet in shoes for a reason, you, you know, like there are things like I don't want you knowing about me like that. Uh, with all these kind of things. Some of you think I respect you as my pastor. I don't think you should do something like for me. And then some of you just think that's just weird. I don't care who you are, like <laughs> wash my feet. And that's why we didn't do it today. But you had these things going through your mind. And that's what Peter felt as Jesus comes to him. He feels all those things, and, and no doubt he, he looks at this and says, I, Lord, you, you shouldn't wash me. I should be washing you. But Jesus says to Peter, he says, unless I wash you, you will have no part with me. 
it's here that we begin to get the idea that Jesus is not just talking about washing feet, is he? He's talking about something more. In fact, what Jesus uses here, this idea of no part with me, it means kind of no place with me. And it's the language that Jesus uses around salvation and judgment. And what Jesus is saying is, Peter, unless you let me wash you, you'll have no life with me. That's a strong statement. Strong statement. And what Jesus is beginning to help Peter to understand is that, is that life with him begins when we allow Jesus to wash us. The Jesus who humbled himself to become a servant for us when we allow in our own humility, because that's what it takes, right? That was some of the discomfort you felt when I was walking by. You thought, oh my gosh, I can't be the person, you know, like uh, to have this happen to me. Like there's a humility that comes with not only being the one washing, but the one being washed. And for some of us, it is difficult to receive grace and love. We would much rather, as terrible as it sounds to wash someone's foot, um, we would rather be on that end of the towel than the receiving end. And yet Jesus says, life with me begins when you humble yourself, as I've humbled myself, and you allow me to wash you. For most of us, when we are loved, we can only receive love when we know there's a clear path to giving love in return, to returning the favor but this washing of Jesus, it's just an act of grace. You, you can't return that. There's nothing you can do. This washing of the, the through, I mean, Jesus isn't just talking about feet, man. He is about talking about washing us through and through. And there's nothing we can do to return love to that kind. Nothing we can do to match that kind of love that makes us feel good. And it is simply a humbling to say, Lord, I'm not worthy, but because of your grace, you want to wash me. And and Peter, as much as he steps in it a little bit here, um, boy, he shows us what, what the response is. In verse 9, he says, well, then, Lord, if that's the case, don't just wash my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Total surrender. You want life with Jesus. It begins when we allow him to do something for us we can't do for ourselves. We humble ourselves. And Peter surrenders to that. You jump down to verse 12. We see when Jesus had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. And he asked them the question. Do you understand what I've done for you? The answer is no. No. They don't understand. They understand something amazing has happened, but they don't understand what he's done. And we'll get to that at the end. But we watch as Jesus transforms back from servant to Lord and teacher. And he begins to teach them. Verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightfully so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. Jesus says, as a one whom you have given authority in your life. You go and do what I've done for you. The same love you've received from me is the love you're to give to one another and to the world. That's the call. Verse 15, Jesus builds on that. He says, I have set you an example that you should do as I've done. Now, the Greek word here for is translated as example. What it really, it's a great translation of that word, um, but it, it means to take it a little step further. It actually means to set a pattern to be imitated. It means that Jesus has not just done something great for them. He's given them something to do for others, something to do in their life. And and what we see here is that this word imitation is not a new word to the disciples. 
In fact, if you were to sum up what it means to be a disciple in the first century, you you could do a lot worse than use the word imitation. Because what disciples would do was that they would come and they would attach themselves to a teacher. And you can't think of a teacher in our modern day context. You know, we have teachers who, who, who come to a class and the kids come to a class and you learn there. And then, you know, kids go home, teacher goes home and tries to recover, uh, you know. But you have a break in between. In the first century, you, you often lived with your students as a teacher. Uh, teachers, you think you have a rough now. Oh, uh, man, imagine your classroom following you home, you know, like. <laughs> And for years, you would go and you would, you would uh, man, you would, you would attach yourself to the teacher. And you would go and you would listen to them teach. And you would begin to watch them live out their teachings. And then you would seek to do the things that they were doing. That's what it meant to be a student of a teacher, a disciple. You imitated. You listened. You watched. You did with the desire that you would ultimately not just do the things that your teacher did, but you would become like them. You would learn how to think like they think. You would develop the character that they had, and that ultimately your life, the actions and the things that you do, would become a reflection of your becoming like your teacher. And what Jesus says to them is he says, if you want to identify with me, then you must imitate me then you're to come alongside me and listen to me teach. You're you're, you're to watch what I do and ultimately begin to do, to work through doing the things that I've done. This wasn't new to the disciples. They signed on for this. And so did we. We signed on for this. And the moment you, you, you let Jesus wash you, and you entered into a new life with him. You, you, you took up the call to be this disciple that says, Jesus, I identify with you and what you've done for me. And so I take up this identity of becoming a servant. And the way that you identified who you are, that you are a servant to all, so I become a servant for you. And what that means for us as modern day disciples is that we have this to listen to Jesus. That we we are diligent about pouring over his words and letting Jesus teach us through his word. That we watch what Jesus does in the scriptures. And that we seek to begin to do what Jesus did. That's what it means to imitate. And the first place for us to begin is with this story, with what it means to be a servant. We see it here, and it's powerful, the call to be a servant and what it looks like to love in this way. And I can assure you, even as we fumble around trying to learn how to be servants and love people sacrificially, it will be awkward at times, but there is no No moment in time that you will look more like Jesus than when you stoop down to serve another. We rise to the heights of Christ-like love when we stoop down in service to another. And so what this means for us today as we think about the church and, and what this, this speaks into our lives, it means that we leave this place being the kind of people who are willing to exchange our cloaks for towels. And the reality is in this, this scripture, what it means for us is that, is that we as a church seek to be a church that emulates this kind of love in our life together where we look for ways to celebrate and to point to the redeeming love of Jesus by making examples like this one a regular part of our life together. Not in every once in a while. Here's the thing. This isn't supposed to be the extraordinary thing or exception to the life, Jesus says, 
This should be routine. This act of loving and serving one another. That we as a church seek to be a place where the love of Christ reigns in us. And a ground by which we practice and grow in being servants of one another because of the bond that we share through Christ our Lord. But it doesn't stop there. Starts there, starts here. But it doesn't stop. And and we're to take the call to love in this way, to serve far beyond the walls of the church. To serve especially, I would say, those who, who don't yet know Jesus. And here's why. I think if we want to be a church that reaches people, people who don't know the Lord, to reach new people for Christ in the world in which we live, um, it will be by stooping down and serving other people. By the church taking seriously the call to grab the towel. Because you and I are here because at one point in your life, the love of Christ became real to us. That you and I were shown and experienced the love of Jesus. And it's only when for some that we take up the towel and serve them that the love of Christ will be real to them. And you might be the vessel through which Jesus reveals his awesome love and opens up a new life for another person. Church, if we're serious about reaching people who do not know the good news, and it will only be when we do this, when we stoop to serve. And if you're looking for a tangible place to start, then I want you to take out your card, the one you might be sitting on, I I don't know. Take out your card. This is a pretty simple place to begin, but let's let's have a starting point. I hope we don't have an ending point with what service looks like to one another and to those in the world, but this is a starting point. This is a card that's essentially an invitation to someone to join us for Easter services. Pretty self-explanatory. You can look at it. You don't need me to walk you through it. My hope, my prayer, is that you'll emulate the service and love for another by being willing to to invite a friend, someone who may not have a church home, and someone who may not even believe. Just to go up to them and simply say, hey, I don't know if you have plans this Easter, but I would love it if you don't, to come sit with me and worship. We'll be at this service on the back. Love to have you come. It's that easy. I'm giving you an easy one, right? It should get a lot harder than this, but this is a place for us to start. Because this invitation... It might be the seed that the Lord uses to lead someone to new life. And so if you want to take seriously the call to identify with Jesus by imitating him and serving and stooping, this is an easy start for us. Shouldn't be the end, but it's the start. I promised you when we got to the end that I would explain, and we are at the end, Um, why I'm so confident the disciples didn't understand what Jesus was doing for them. You might say, we're just washing their feet, isn't he? He is, but he's doing more. Here's what they didn't understand. What Jesus did for them was really pointing to what he was about to do for them. You see, when Jesus kneels down and washes their feet when he takes up the towel. Jesus is making the proclamation that he is indeed the suffering servant. The one who in Isaiah 53 points to as God sending one who would be a king to the people. What we see here on Palm Sunday, a king to the people who would rule not by being over the people, but by taking their brokenness upon himself. And that by taking their brokenness, he brings healing into their life, but it crushes them, it kills them. But by taking their punishment, by taking the, he, the people are saved. And so what Jesus does in this meal is he shows them the picture of a servant. 
And here in just a few hours, he's going to suffer for them. And so Jesus is showing you, I'm, I'm the suffering servant who's come to save you, to wash not just your feet, but your entire being, not in water, but in my blood. And as 1 John 1, 7 said, it is the blood of Christ that cleanses us of all sin. Jesus has come as a suffering servant to give life. And so as we respond to the word, there's opportunity if you want to come down to the altar to pray um, or if you want to remain in, in your seat. Um, I want us to pray specifically today um, for the person that you're going to invite because I know you will. And, and so if um, you're a guest with us, we'd love for you to invite somebody. But if you're a member, you're obligated. All right. Um, but, uh, so that's if you identify as a member here, then, then imitate. Let's let's do this. I'm, I'm serious. Um, but I want us to be in prayer for the person that you're going to invite. Maybe you already know someone. Maybe you're waiting for an opportunity this week, whatever it might be. Um, we're going to start by praying. And so let's let's bow together. Lord, we need your help. <laughs> when it comes to loving in this way, it's not natural to us. It's not easy to us. It flows out of your being. We pray that you would change us in such a way that, that servanthood flows out of who we are. And, and let us start here at this place. Though it may not seem simple, it may seem like it takes a lot of courage for us to invite someone to join us in church to come be a part of us. But God, this is actually a simple step. But let it be our first step to saying yes to you, yes to being servants as you're a servant to us. And so put in our mind, put in our heart that person who we want to invite. We pray you help them just emerge in our mind, on our heart this week. And we pray that it would be a seed you use to maybe even lead them to the life that is truly life, the abundant life in Christ. For that is our hope. Let us be your servants for your glory. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There are precious joy it's been to come and worship together as the church. Uh, if you're a first-time guest, we're so glad you're here, and thank you for, for joining us, and um, aren't you glad I didn't pick you out today? Uh, so that's, that's a good thing, but we would love, uh, Miss Sue's in the back, would love to give you a gift, so be sure to go see her. Um, we also have a couple of announcements. One of those is that Praise Hunt in the Park is today. We'd love to have you come and serve and be a presence. It's at 3 o'clock in Kimmel Park 
over here, and we look forward to being the church. This is one of the ways in which we get to make the good news present in our church, and so uh, fulfilling the great, the great commission to reach people for Jesus. And so um, let's be sure to, to give our energy and time to that. It's going to be a great day. Uh, we'll be handing out over 10,000 Easter eggs, so it's going to be a lot uh, be a lot of fun for, for kids. So invite your kids or grandkids to come. Uh, we also have this Sunday, this week, we have uh, Holy Week services, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday on Thursday and Friday. Uh, it's 6.30. Uh, Monday, Thursday, we'll be in the Family Life Center, and then we'll be in here on Good Friday in the sanctuary. Love for you to come and be a part of those services. a great way to lead into Easter. And, of course, Easter Sunday, we'll have all three regular services. Be sure, seriously, to invite somebody um, uh, this is this is serious. I mean, I, I, we want to be the kind of church that starts with having a heart for people to know Jesus as, as he so graciously made himself known to us. begins with being invitational. So let's take that first step this week. First step towards saying yes to Jesus, um, that I will be a servant as you are a servant. Amen.